And now, Django, you may choose your character's costume. You's gonna let me pick up my own clothes? Yeah, but of course. I have big ideas when it comes to presentation. Mm. Yeah, he needs to have panache. A sense of showmanship. Showmanship. When it comes to costume design, Quentin found his perfect partner, Sharon Davis, who is amazingly talented. Sharon Davis, beyond. Her eyes, she had every little puff on the shoulder of the girls and the dresses just completely right. She's all about the detail and all about the specificity and making sure that she's serving the vision of the director. She took us back to that day, but there was a certain crispness to it. Like the way she had Kristoff looking was amazing. Samuel Jackson's clothes were eloquent. Sharon makes the wardrobe a character. The characters were so strong and the storyline was so interesting. Quentin knows every aspect of filmmaking, and you know his finger is on every part of the film. It's in the sets, it's in the lighting, it's, it's everywhere. And of course, it's in the costumes. He's definitely all hands on. I think particularly when you're doing a, a period film, so much of who the character is is wrapped up in the clothes and the shoes and the look, and she has such a stellar imagination. There was nothing Quentin couldn't throw at her that she didn't catch create and exceed his expectations. I mean, she is one of his all-stars. Every look, right, pretty much illustrated for all the lead characters. Django's first look is a slave look, and we didn't want too much of a caricature. We really wanted that authentic. We had to do a transition from the first plantation he was on as he was sold, and this whole walk until he was bought. And then as we progress and Dr. Schultz and Django decide on this camaraderie, they're going to a store and buy some new clothes for Django so he doesn't look like a slave. And Django decides, you know, basically he wants to look like a king. It was written to where Kristoff's character picks the outfit out. And I was like, could I ask that we switch it around? And Kristoff also suggested it too. I said, a slave who's never worn anything but a sack, no shoes, no nothing, he wants to pick out his outfit. He's gonna pick something that everybody's gonna see. I ain't picking no gray or no brown. What's that? And just a little side note, you know black folks like colors, man. I was like, man, I need that teal blue. <laughs> Quentin was absolutely right when the girl is looking at the clothes. You know how women are. Didn't you hear him tell you I ain't no slave? So you really free? Yes, I was free. You mean you want to dress like that? So that's why whenever we do get married or get a girlfriend, they always change. They go through our closets and ah, why don't you wear this? Well, you mean you don't like the uh, chartreuse maroon? Chartreuse is, is a new, it's chartreuse. She was constantly on it, like, how do we make this character transition in this clothes as well? Like the pine trees lining the winding road. His final outfit, we do a more timeless look and do a cowboy, which is not really the period, but it's not not the period either, because in the far west, there was prairie look. It just wasn't popular in the south. But that's what Django decides he wants to be in. Good morning, innkeeper. Kristoff's my favorite. After this whole show, I'm still excited to see what Kristoff's going to wear. The parameters on Dr. Schultz was he can only wear shades of gray. That's accurate. But gray is a big family, which is kind of cool. Gray is not one color. Gray is endless, endless variations in connection with the texture and the weave and the directions and the layers and, 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 and all of that. It's marvelous. She's a fantastic designer. Kristoff can wear clothes like no one's business. You know, Kristoff can really wear clothes. It doesn't really matter. You know, he can handle anything. I'm Dr. King Schultz. This is my horse, Fritz. I think his hat was the longest project of ours for Kristoff, the perfect hat. We, did, we didn't really want it to be European. Sure, that's him. But we didn't want it to be Northern. So we actually morphed a hat. It's a combination of a derby and a Western hat and it made him the bounty hunter he needed to be. And it kind of like sealed the deal in all the clothes. The brown suede jacket was one of my favorite outfits of Leonardo's. Calvin Candy, even as the most evil plantation owner in the world, he's dashing and there's a charm to him. 
about my $500? The writing coat was all Quentin. He so said, Sherry, now imagine this, like a trench coat, but in suede. But I know it's not. <laughs> He had this faux quality to him. He was trying to be this European, a sort of upper crusty aristocrat, but meanwhile, it was all fake. You do not have anything to drink. Can I get you a tasty refreshment? Yes. It had this beauty to it, but also a certain amount of tackiness and audaciousness to his clothing. You know, the hat and the boots and the cigarette, all of it just put together is fun. So Hildy, how you like serving at the big table in the big house, huh? It's just wonderful to work with Sharon because she's able to carry it through and, and manifest these amazingly wardrobed characters. It was really fun to do. Quinn basically said, Sharon, show me. Show me what you think Broomhilda is. So I did a few sketches, and luckily I worked with Carrie before, so I knew her body. And um, she's completely illustrated, and you can put her next to the illustration, and she kind of goes perfectly into the look. Quentin, at the beginning, gave me a few ideas of how Django would see Broomhilda in visions. Like when he's going to Candyland, she's in a yellow umpir dress that's from the early 1800s just walking like the sun, and that just was like a ray of hope. It didn't really fit in the movie, but that's what Django's seeing. You know, she's a vision. Sharon is just so intuitive, and she knows how to make you look your best. And she had a lot of fun putting Mogi together. Good to see you again, Mr. Mogi. Oh, Mogi. He was so fun. Oh, this is the one-eyed Charlie I've heard so much about. Yes. Quentin was there the whole time while we were creating Mogi. Quentin talked to Sharon about the fact that he wanted to keep the palette for this character in light, lightness all the time. Just like he wanted Kristoff in all gray, he really wanted Mogi in beige, with a little bit of color, just all beige. So that's kind of how we came up with his look. Get free man Django here, whatever he wants, and I'll have sweet tea and bourbon. Sharon ranks up there with the best, and everything that she does helps bring my character to life. You don't wear a hat in the house, white man, even I know that. She just puts the stuff on and it builds and she makes me feel comfortable in my clothing. Have we seen beautiful period costumes in other movies? Yes, but Sharon really thought out Laura Lee in a pretty thorough way. Now, where is my beautiful sister? I decided for her first change we see her, she's dressed a little too young for her age. This attractive Southern belle is my widowed sister. Darling, you are a tonic for tired eyes. Mm -hmm. May I present to you Lola Lee Candy Fitzwilling. Just a little bit of a Blanche Dubois kind of thing, but she, she, she pulls it off. And then for her next change, which is all these men at her house, she comes yeah, down like, you know, Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> the tiara and, you know, royal colors. and So her whole life is probably putting on clothes. She's always themed. The dresses she's made, whether it's the cupcake or the Mardi Gras dress, which is the one in the dining scene that's Mardi Gras colors, they're both so feminine. They're so show-stopping. But they're both totally believable as garments. They're not just movie dresses. They're dresses that somebody would have in their closet. She put this outfit on, walked on set, and I immediately knew who Billy Crash was. You better listen to your boss, white boy. Oh, I'm gonna go walking in the moonlight with you. You wanna hold my hand? He just became this amazing character. He's the best dressed of all the overseers I've done. I mean, because I put so much into making uh, 90 guys look different. They have one or two costumes, and I have to make them individuals, and that's the biggest challenge I've ever had to do. The extras felt very well taken care of. It was a hard subject matter for them as well, and Sharon did a really good job of making everybody feel really comfortable. This is a difficult period piece. There's a lot of heavy costuming for a lot of people, and she's doing it like it's a walk in the park. Some wear jackets, some wear vests, some wear shirts, some wear double shirts. How they carry themselves is really important of how I'm going to dress them. If they're more statuesque, I put a jacket on them and make them a little more gentlemanly. But if they come in and they're very scruffy and look like they don't take showers, it's, then I dress them down. 
I dressed the slaves from each plantation by the plantation owner for old man Karakran. I kind of took the color out there because it is like a flashback. I did great silhouettes with just almost no color. And then when we went to Candyland, you can tell who's in with Boss Candy and who's not. The slaves that are with them are dressed amazing. And then the ones way out in the field are really rough. And then the Mandingos are showing off their body, you know, basically. Big Daddy's plantation was more colorful. And the women, of course, were more beautiful. And they were better dressed. And even the people in the fields just seemed a little happier. Because I, I, to me, his, he was a little more benevolent. So that plantation, I kind of lifted it up a little bit. What if I was to say I don't like you? And I wouldn't sell you a tinker's dam. Now, what you got to say about that? I know how Quentin likes Don, obviously, Miami Vice. So when he came in, I thought, mm, Big Daddy. Let's see, let's do a little Colonel Sanders with Miami Vice and just kind of put it together and see what I can come up with. Who are you two jokers? Like a sexy Colonel Sanders. <laughs> you know, Quentin had ideas and I had some thoughts. And gratefully, Sharon Davis saved both of our asses and, and came up with the, <laughs> with the, uh, the, the, the linen suit, you know, and the and the little petite string tie, because you know they wore a lot of cravats and stuff back there. He's the first fitting. He's the first fitting off the illustration. And that's when Quentin said, oh my gosh, that's perfect. He looks exactly like that. And that's when I, oh my gosh, yeah. Big Daddy is basically your, your everyday run of the mill pimp in the 1850s. <laughs> I love Don. He brought great touches. This is my contribution. Can you see those? These are my contribution. These are the snakeskin boots that that I thought were just, you know, if I didn't have them, the character wasn't right. I mean, I may as well just scrap the whole movie. There'd be no Big Daddy. There'd be no Big Daddy. 